Ladies and gentlemen, uh, great pleasure for me to uh, welcome you, in fact, uh, to this uh, webinar hosted by the Enterprise Europe Network. Uh, I'm Jean-David Malo, I'm the uh, director in charge of the implementation uh, of uh, numerous programs within the uh, European Innovation Council and uh, SME's executive uh, agencies. This Embracing Global Markets webinar series uh, provides crucial market intelligence and information, notably on, regular, on regulatory um, requirements helping European businesses and innovators to expand in fast-growing markets in Asia, Africa and, of course, uh, Americas. Um, and our webinars, in fact, uh, address European small and medium-sized enterprise, startups uh, ready to scale internationally, holders of the seals of excellence, as well as beneficiaries of the European Innovation Council, and, of course, the business advisors of the, uh, Europe, of the Enterprise Europe Network, clusters managers, and uh, staff of other European business support uh, organizations. For the few webinar participants who have not yet heard about us, uh, the uh, Enterprise Europe Network is nothing else than one of the world's uh, largest service provider for businesses with international ambitions. And with the collective expertise uh, of over 3,000 business advisors, the Enterprise Europe Network establishes a, a vast global commercial marketplace for trade and research and development cooperation, comprising the uh, EU single market, boosting some 450 million consumers and access to IP for cutting edge green technologies. So in a nutshell, we can say that the Enterprise Europe Networks provide premium international business and technology partnering services, as well as in-depth advisory services, helping companies to innovate, to expand in new market and to adopt sustainable business models. In my role of uh, director of uh, the executive agency, um, ESMIA, uh, I naturally also would like to uh, uh, use this opportunity to size this occasion to promote funding opportunities for European startup acquiring uh, grants and equity via the European Innovation Council, the EIC. The EIC is uh, one of Europe's most ambitious innovation initiative. It uh, combines uh, support uh, uh, via advanced research on emerging technologies uh, up to uh, the support uh, of uh, deep tech startup uh, and SMEs with an accelerator program, which has a purpose to help them to uh, scale up uh, quickly. So the accelerator clearly uh, is uh, providing uh, grant and equity support. Uh, to our deep tech startup to um, provide, in fact, uh, on the market game changing innovation, meaning um, that uh, we are providing these companies with, uh, in one hand, uh, a ground support and an equity support, what we are calling blended finance, an equity support that can reach up to 15 million euros on our side, but also attracting other investors with currently a leverage effect of 3.5, meaning that uh, in average, uh, our round, in fact, uh, can go up to uh, 50, 60 million euros. The ground part is um, going up to 2.5 million euros, and in fact, is de-risking a part of the investment that the other investors are ready to do in a, a segment which is by definition on deep tech still uh, very risky and uh, our objective will be to um, to support up to 10 billion euro uh, this uh, top class innovators scientists researchers and entrepreneurs that uh, can bring um, game-changing uh, innovation today's webinar will uh, focus on doing business in the united states and what you need to know about the u.s startup ecosystem uh, this webinar will provide an overview of the legal framework and regulation when opening a startup in the U.S., which means information about uh, the local startup environment and challenges of launching a startup in the United States. This is another funding option for early stage companies. All what you need to know when working with U.S. investors as cross-border startup. 
last but not least, uh, tax implication and how they relate to your fundraising strategy. So this webinar will touch a number of uh, key issues, including 10 key legal issues to consider when you decide uh, to try to enter in the US market. I would like uh, at this occasion to extend my sincere gratitude to the European American Chamber of Commerce, who have put in in countless hours to, uh, to make this session possible. So uh, very uh, huge thanks uh, on my side and on collectively also uh, from the agency and our colleague from uh, DG Grow. We deeply appreciate your efforts and the uh, opportunity to learn more about doing business uh, in uh, the United States. We encourage, of course, the webinar participant to interact with our experts. Raise your hand, uh, post your questions via the WebEx chat or in the, the YouTube, uh, YouTube comment section. Importantly, if you need further support to enter the US market with your startup, do not hesitate to reach out to our local uh, Enterprise Europe network contact points. We are at your service to uh, really support your exciting growth journey across the uh, Atlantic Ocean, which is uh, so important also for the competitiveness uh, of the European companies. So this uh, webinar will be another demonstration on how the Enterprise Europe Network and the European Innovation Council can work closely together with a uh, huge impact. I'm certain that today's session will attract numerous uh, EIC beneficiaries or seal of excellence uh, holders. Um, alongside the um, invaluable services offered through the EIC business acceleration, our beneficiaries can always rely on the expertise uh, of our experienced Enterprise Europe Network business advisors around the globe. I, I like to insist uh, on a regular basis of this possibility because this is really providing a very uh, important uh, input and, uh, and support. So, as usual, we will stream this webinar um, live uh, into the most widely used uh, social media platforms such as YouTube, uh, X, Facebook, and uh, LinkedIn. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the esteemed uh, participants, uh, looking at the time, uh, I would like to uh, conclude my welcome address uh, in okay. order to uh, go in the social media platforms such as YouTube, uh, X, Facebook, and uh, LinkedIn. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed uh, participants, uh, looking at the time, uh, I would like to uh, put my welcome address uh, in order to go in the social media platforms such as YouTube. Getting the background noise, there we go. Are we? All right. Welcome and thank you, Jean-David. My name is Erin McKelvey. I am the president and CEO of the European American Chamber of Commerce in Texas. And I'd like to welcome you to the European American Chamber of Commerce's second EEN workshop, specially created for our colleagues and counterparts on the other side of the Atlantic to help you and your companies prepare for an international expansion to the United States. Today's program theme is doing business in the United States, what you need to know about the US startup ecosystem. This event is organized by the EACC Texas. I will be your host and moderator for the first half of today's event. My colleague EACC New York director, Yvonne Bendinger Rothschild will moderate the second half. Now I'd like to take a moment to introduce our member panelists in the United States. Kevin Coyne is a seasoned entrepreneur and the CEO and founder of Tech Ranch in Austin, Texas, a global venture accelerator that has supported entrepreneurs from over 42 countries. Known for his pioneering work in the startup community, Kevin's innovative community-based approach has helped numerous emerging technology companies not only accelerate, but also disrupt their targeted markets. Dan Glazer is an American technology lawyer, strategic business advisor, and the managing partner of Wilson Sonsini's London office. Since, the, since 2010, Dan has advised high growth European technology and life sciences companies on raising capital in the US and Europe, expanding their businesses into the US markets and connecting with investors. Oliver Hecking, 
partner at Rodeland Partner USA, is jointly responsible for the Charlotte, North Carolina and Greenville, South Carolina offices. As a German tax advisor and US certified public accountant, Oliver has been advising German medium sized companies and private individuals on their US activities for more than 25 years. He is a frequent speaker on various international tax and accounting topics. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for being here. So our first segment, we're gonna go ahead and get started with Kevin. Um, Kevin is an integral part of the Austin startup ecosystem for the past 30 years. I'd like to begin by asking you to share a historical perspective of the US startup environment and how it has changed or evolved since the pandemic. I'll turn it over to you. Sounds great. Thank you, Erin. Uh, thank you, John D David, for uh, for this opportunity. And it's my honor to uh, to be speaking to you from Austin, Texas. And welcome to all my friends in Europe. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, bridge building with you. So what I'm going to do is I, I have just a couple of slides that I think are a little bit easier to visualize the distinctions that we might want to um, to to share. The startup activity, obviously, in the United States, a lot of people know about Silicon Valley in Boston and New York. And the thing I thought would be interesting to share today is some of the distinctions that have happened since uh, over the last few years, because a lot of this information hasn't necessarily been shared. And since I'm in the middle of the country here in Texas, one of the things that's interesting to see is how startup activity has changed. And there's been a big shift in the United States. The previous slide that I shared was in 2018 from the, the US Census Bureau. Now we can see that startups are starting in other parts of the US. Now on this list of the top 10 uh, most active startup activities, one of the things I'd like you to see is how there's been a massive shift towards Texas. In fact, three of the top 10 um, startup capitals in the United States are actually in Texas. And a lot of people haven't seen this, or a lot of my friends and colleagues in Europe haven't necessarily seen the shift. So that's what I thought might be interesting to see that uh, the perspective of how it has shifted away from California, some at least, into uh, these areas. And you'll see that, in fact, the, the governor of Texas just announced in the last four months that Texas has become the eighth largest economy in the world in itself and just the state. Part of why I, I share that is to say that um, if you're looking at a place to land your startup of, if you're looking for soft landing into the United States, you might consider Texas, especially depending on the type of technology you're, you're leveraging. Now, there are some differences. Um, the Angel Capital Association says that you, you might still get a highest the highest evaluation for your startup, but also a higher cost in California. And this is this kind of gives us a sense. And of course, this is averages across lots of different startups. But the uh, the thing that I think is interesting is to see out of the um, one of the profiling tools that we use to track startups and scale ups across Texas, you'll see that there's quite a variety of different areas to plug into now. I could go into more depth on each one, and we might look at how Houston is really deeply focused on energy and healthcare. Dallas is more focused on semiconductors, batteries, and historically retail and other Fortune 500 kind of companies. Austin has this flavor of being cross products among, you know, because it's a, you're a short drive away from those other markets. You'll see a lot of interactions and cross products, different kind of innovation here in Austin. Um, we can go into deeper questions and stuff like that as we have time. I can go into more depth on each one, but these are the areas that you're seeing just explode in Texas. And we'll come back. I have a few more slides that we might share in a little bit, um, but I wanted just to give you kind of a first sense of if Texas isn't on your map, for what's happened because of historical information about Silicon Valley or Boston. You might consider it just because the market is very open here and the Texas is a very uh, friendly, uh, friendly business state. 
Okay, great. And and that is definitely a big shift since the pandemic, which is what we were looking for. Um, and Dan, I'd like to ask you, you've been working in Europe for some time. And um, what is your view from across the pond of the startup communities in the U.S. and how they may be evolving? Yeah, no, I mean, I think what we, we, we've seen, and again, this is a little bit tied to the pandemic, is that historically, um, you know, Silicon Valley was sort of the, the place to go from a start ecosystem standpoint in the United States, but it's definitely evolved over the past several years and maybe accelerated by the pandemic. I think there, there's no doubt, and the statistics back this up, that, um, there is the, 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 the center of fundraising in the United States for startups still tends to be Silicon Valley or the broader Bay Area. Right. But in terms of building and scaling startups, um, it, it, there, there's a lot more diversity in, in terms of where you, you see that. And certainly, I think the, the sort of top tech hubs in that regard around the U.S. now outside the Bay Area, you're talking about places like New York, Boston, Austin, Seattle, Chicago, Miami. Right. And, and each of those is and a few others, right, are, are slightly different. You know, for example, if you are a med tech life sciences startup, you know, you might focus in particular on going to Boston or maybe San, San Diego. If you're a fintech startup, you might look at going to New York or going to it, it, Atlanta. Um, you know, and it's, it's important, though, to not sort of get blinded in, in Europe that, you know, everybody going to the United States as a startup needs to go to the Bay Area and scale there. That may be the right answer. And I will say, that the earlier stage the European company is when they expand to America, the more likely it is that in our experience that they end up going to the Bay Area. Because it still remains statistically a fact that the, the greatest center of fundraising in the US tends to, for startups, tends to be the Bay Area. And if you're moving to the US as a European startup early in your life cycle, more often than not, we find that those companies are moving to raise money, right? Whereas at a slightly later stage, let's say post series A startups that are going to the United States, more often than not, they're looking to expand to the US rather than move to the US. In other words, they, what they're doing is looking to an American, Americanize a product or service offering that they've already built a foundation for in Europe. And now they're getting pulled into the US by customer traction or user growth. And what they often find is that to replicate that model and Americanize it, it actually works best in, let's say, cities that are similar to what they, saw, they, they had in Europe. So let's say that they were in Berlin or Amsterdam or Paris. You know, those are cities where the model of startups is tech supporting industry, right? And that is very similar to cities like New York or Atlanta or a Boston or some, something like that. Whereas in Silicon Valley, if the startup ecosystem really is tech is the industry, right? And that's a little bit unique within the US e ecosystem. Yeah, that's true. Um, legally speaking, are there good, better or best places to land in the US? I mean, are states different um, legally speaking? So from a legal standpoint, um, there's a difference between where you set up your, your company legally from a corporate structure and standpoint, and there is where you operationally set up your business. In other words, more often than, than not, sort of the, the de facto national company in the US, because there is no national company, you pick one of the 50 states in which to incorporate. But the one that many, many companies for many decades have incorporated in is Delaware, right? It doesn't mean that you open up your office in Delaware, although Delaware is a fine state, right? And you don't you don't need to put people necessarily on the ground in the United States, but from a from an incorporation standpoint, it tends to have the most the, the best corporate governance laws. It has its own corporate governance courts. Um, it, it creates efficiencies. It's cost effective. I often say, as the headline takeaway for European startups, Delaware reduces friction. More often than not, if, as a European startup, if you decide to incorporate in a state other than Delaware you will end up finding that you've created more friction than you necessarily needed to. But that's a completely different point from where you, you set up operationally in the United States. 
right? And unless, you know, assuming that you're not a regulated business, like a regulated FinTech or a regulated InsurTech or, or, or um, you know, a pharma company, right? Life sciences company, where there are substantial state by state differences in the regulatory environment. Unless you're a regulatory regulated business, you know, we, we see comp European startups going to the US not necessarily focusing on the legal aspects of state by state, but it's more the commercial and operational aspects of which state is best to go. In other words, where is the talent that you're looking to hire? And is it concentrated anywhere in particular? Is where, where are your current or potential future VCs? Where are your current or potential future um, um, customers or users? How are you looking to manage employees in the US? I will tell you that having people on the East Coast is a lot easier to manage if you are not sending anyone over to HQ than it is trying to hire only locally, not sending anyone over from European HQ and trying to build a West Coast or, or sort of you know, central US business. Or what are the incentives offered by state and local economic development organizations to set up your business in the US, right? What's the cost um, of a particular state or city to set up? Those are the types of factors that, that we find that companies coming out of Europe typically focus on when choosing which state and which city. Erin, you're muted. This is a pretty broad question, but um, just given you know the time frame that we have and lots to cover, but it's super important to know you know what are the main legal considerations that you would say you know the top to you when scaling into the United States. So the first thing is, and, and the most common question that we get is, when do I need to create a U.S. company? And typically, the bright red line of when you need a U.S. company. And as I said, it tends to be a, a Delaware subsidiary, right? Um, is when you are looking to hire US employees. You do not generally want to hire US employees directly out of a European parent company for three reasons tax, liability, and ambiguity of employment law. And I'll just sort of leave it for that given time, right? But when you when you are ready to hire employees in the United States, you would typically set up a Delaware subsidiary and hire them through that subsidiary. Um, as an aside, you don't generally need a US company to hire consultants in the United States. And you don't, generally speaking, need a US company to enter into contracts in the US. Now, there are some exceptions to that, like when you sell into certain um, national government organizations like the US military or, or otherwise, you, you actually do need a US company. And it's, it's sometimes it's company policy of other US companies to only contract with US companies. But generally speaking, U.S. companies tend to focus more on whether your commercial contract is governed by the laws of a U.S. state rather than whether or not you happen to have a hollow shell U.S. Sub subsidiary to contract out of, right? But once you, you create the U.S. subsidiary, then the, the key legal considerations tend to be, there you tend to be five of them, right? Number one, um, employment. In other words, do you have the right employment documents in place? And employment law in the US is state by state. Each state has its own employment laws, and sometimes it's very, very different. And we often find that some startups coming out of Europe might have a, a New York agreement, and they will just cross out New York and write California uh, when it's time to hire a California employee. And I will tell you, as a European startup, that would be like being a French company and going to Germany, crossing out France and writing Germany into your French employment contract. It doesn't really work that well, right? So incorporation, employment, share options. You should be aware as a European startup that on average, American employees are very, very focused on the potential upside of receiving options in a way that on average, European startup employees are not. And you should, be, you should figure out how is it that you are going to provide options to incentivize US startup employees. And those are always going to be out of the parent company, never out of the subsidiary, because all of the value in, in the company sits at the parent level, not at the subsidiary. And that's why the what's that's what the employees are looking for is the upside of the parent company. Right? Um, quickly, maybe the last few legal bits to keep in mind: data privacy. There is no GDPR in the United States. Each state has its own uh, data, data privacy rules. Commercial contracts. 
You may want to Americanize your European contracts for the U.S. market. And then finally, intellectual property. Patents and trademarks are geography specific. You'll want to look at extending your IP protection to the United States as part of U.S. expansion. Yeah, I think this goes back to exactly what we talked about in our first uh, webinar is um, if you have attorneys in, in Europe, they don't necessarily know what needs to be done in the United States and make sure that um, you're talking to people in both in both places. Extremely important. Um, Kevin, I think this is a really interesting topic. I mean, you've seen thousands of good and not so good attempts to enter the U.S. market. Um, I guess every try is is uh, is good in some sense, but um, what are the two or three mistakes that cross-border startups make when entering the U.S. market that really come to mind for you? There, there are definitely two two things that really pop out at me. Um, the recently, as an example, we were working with an Austrian startup that had gotten you know, traction back home in a very general way. They had been able to actually engage in a couple different areas and had had financial success in that. And they you know, essentially, if you're familiar with the lean startup practices, they'd gone through problem solution fit, they'd gone through product market fit, they're in growth, but now they're coming to the US. The US is the most, you know, violently competitive market in the world in almost any category. and. The thing that you have to have in this market is you have to be ready to go back and do product market fit again. If for those of you that are not familiar with the lean startup practices, you have to actually re you're, you're, you're moving into a different market. So you, nat you, you naturally have to figure out how to enter the market again. And a lot of times for specific entrepreneurs, the, the, you know, it feels like, well, wait, no, we're beyond that. We already know what we're doing um, without, having the discipline to do that. And I, the, the sad thing about this is we'll see a company come, whether to Austin or someplace in Texas or even in other markets, and the markets will just reject them. In fact, I saw this with a lot of the ventures that we worked with in Silicon Valley, that, you know, it's, it's expensive to come to the U.S. You have to have a niche strategy. You have to have an entry point that you're going to make a beachhead. And then from there, you can expand out. That is the, I mean, I'm, I'm hitting both of my different issues at different points. Have a beachhead, be prepared for engaging in, re-engaging re in product market fit activities. It's almost like you're restarting the startup in a way. You're not going all the way back to zero, but you have to have the discipline for that. Otherwise, I've seen time and time again, you know, really well-funded companies, scale-ups, come to this market and bounce off of it and have to return home empty handed. Yeah, that's 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 unfortunate. Um, and hopefully today we can um, help some companies with a good direction. Oliver, we're going to bring you in now as a tax advisor to European companies. What are the most significant tax considerations when entering the US for startups or restartups, um, such as federal and state taxes? And um, and do these implications remain consistent for all industries, or are there variations? Thanks, Aaron. Yes, um, there are a couple of tax considerations, um, and I'm definitely going to uh, agree with what uh, the speakers uh, before me have said, and we've seen this as well. So we work with pretty much, I mean, predominantly German-speaking, like Swiss, Austrian, German, but we also work with other European countries. So we exclusively to bring them over here. So, and uh, there's a few things. The tax regime here in the US, uh, in the United States is uh, is somewhat different than in Europe. So we have two levels of taxation. We have the federal tax. And there it is important to understand that there's uh, a double taxation treatment with most European company, uh, countries, which is very important for different on different areas. But also there's the state tax. So we, and you have to remind, if you look at the American flag, there's 50 stars on it. So you have 50 states and each states uh, has their, have their own authority and the rules are sometimes different. So you cannot just say, if I go, let's say to Texas, it's all the same if I would go to New York or to North Carolina. So each state has different rules and it's completely different. The taxation may be different as well. So you have to keep that in mind. It's like in Europe, it's 
it's like going to Germany, invest in Germany or in France. It's a different country and different rules. So you have to make, keep that in mind. For federal tax purposes, you pay a federal income tax. If you decide to incorporate as a corporation, you have a flat tax of 21%, and then you have a state tax, a state income tax, which varies depending on what in, uh, what state you are operating in. So it could be from two, 3% up to eight, nine, 10%. So the average uh, tax rate is probably gonna be around 25% to operate here in the US on profits you make, you have to pay tax on. Um, and the other question is important. Uh, we heard Delaware now. Yes, we do also have a lot of clients who still incorporate in Delaware, but that's not where they're ending up to having their business. They operate in Delaware because they, in the initial phase uh, to set up their companies, they're still looking at various states. They're talking to various state organizations, to economic development organizations, and to find out what is the best place for us to do business. But once they decide that, then they incorporate or register the company to be to do business in that particular state. Um, and then from a tax perspective, you have to also understand that when you're operating out of uh, one state, you may have to file income tax returns in other states based on your activities. And that's based on whether you have employees in that state, whether you do services or you visit trade shows, um, whether you have physical, you, you have warehouses in the state. So that could trigger Nexus. It's called a connection to the state. And we have clients that are filing in 30, 40 states, uh, the income tax returns, and it's going to be allocated. So there's differences. And I would definitely agree with the statement as well. Once you go to the S, you need to talk to experts, to lawyers, to CPAs, to other experts in the area who understand the US business and who can advise you properly. Because we have seen many, many mistakes, which could have been avoided if they would have talked to the appropriate advisors. Definitely. And um, thank you so much, Oliver. There's so much more to discuss on, on taxation and all of the different things involved. Um, right now, we're going to go ahead and move on to the second segment about VCs and other funding options. And at this point, I'm going to turn um, the moderation over to my colleague Yvonne um, in New York City. Thank you, Erin. Um, nice to meet everybody. Um, so we're moving to uh, um, funding options. Um, one of the um, uh, one of many reasons um, it, European startups come to the United States, but a major factor. Um, uh, Kevin, I want to start with you. Um, what are you seeing when it comes to funding options um, for early stage companies? So my, my background is a little bit different. Um, there, there's um, the, the comments that uh, Daniel made earlier uh, from the about the United States and especially the the type of funding, type of activity and all that sort of stuff. I come from a different background. And so I, 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 I want to make sure that this doesn't come across as right or wrong. But the big difference that I might say on the type of fundings that I've seen in in my career and a lot of the companies that we've worked with, I mean, a lot of people have already seen this, the, you know, all the different stages of, uh, of funds and different sources of funds. A lot of the deep tech that we're working with, uh, we're finding that, especially right now, since we're in a transition, you know, in a very transfer, transformational time in, the world of startups history or just the world in general, right? There's lots of disruptive technologies that are coming out there. And so certainly you're gonna see all the different types of capital that we have on this slide. But the thing that I think is most interesting is that there are more companies, large corporates that are driving skunk works, they're doing strategic investment than we've ever seen before. And um, so I would actually point to the strategic investors box right here that you can see even earlier. In fact, in my background, since I've always been an innovator across my career, uh, we're seeing many more corporations that recognize that they need early adopter technology. They need emerging technology. And given that Europe has been such a great place for, you know, fundamental sciences developed, that then turned into technology and the technology as it's being turned into products. I think the thing that I wanna make sure that I raise my hand about and say, hey, this is a slightly different thing that at least I see from my point of view is that the innovation conversations are much more alive. Now, every other box that's on this page, um, yeah, you're going to have, 
you're going to have you know funding that's in the more traditional boxes than before. Um, but the one thing that I want to point to, especially for if as we talk about deep tech startups that might be coming from Europe, is this early adopter organizations or corporations that know that they have to shift quickly. I would be aware of that. The other type of thing is there are a lot of grants here in Austin, Texas, since we have the U.S. Army Futures Command, since we have the AFWORKS, which is the U.S. Air Force's innovation arm. We now have just recently announced Navy X, which is the U.S. Navy's um, innovation arm. There are a lot of funds that are going to deep tech. In fact, DARPA, a lot of times, um, the defense, um, essentially the innovation arm of the U.S. government is spending a lot of money and they will make investments in emerging technology in other parts of the world that then create, creates the opportunity for landing in the US, United States, like Daniel said, and getting SBIRs, that stands for Paul, Small Business Innovator Research Grants. And we've seen a lot of that type of activity. Now, partially, let me put the caveat on, so this builds the bridge to what Daniel said earlier. The, it's partially because of my background as an innovator. But one of the things that I think is most interesting about this bridge to Europe is that there is a very special way that deep tech startups can land in the United States and find funding that might not be traditionally on the VC chart or the investment chart that I shared earlier. What I think is really interesting with your investment chart, and it's the first and only time I've ever seen this before, is that you had the dollar amounts and the commas and this number of zeros. Because what I always get is, uh, what I often see is companies coming over here. I'm ra I want to talk to private equity. I'm raising $2 million. And I'm like, no, you don't. Um, you either are raising too many dollars but you, or you want to talk to private equity. But the two things don't go together. If you're raising $2 million, you need to talk to a VC. If you're talking to private equity, you need to raise $100 million. So um, can you just um, help um, us understand how you find the best um, fit for um, for um, for your company and your for your fundraising um, ob objectives. You know, um, I want to make sure that I do this gently, but I, coming to this market, finding experts like the my myself and my fellow panelists, um, I would just I would say get help. A lot of times, as entrepreneurs, we're taught to be pioneers. And we're like, we just got to tough it out and do it the old fashioned way. I would be very careful about that and actually look for look for support. The other side of it, too, is um, what we attempt to do. And I, you don't have to be involved with the tech range to do what I'm about to say is to really start the process before you get on an airplane. There are too many international entrepreneurs, and I've seen this from every continent minus Antarctica. That, you know, that are coming to Austin because Austin's the new new place, but they're landing here before doing any virtual work. There's so much of this process that now can be done virtually before, you know, maybe even before you're thinking about entering the U.S. market, you should have kind of the, the small investment of time to look, look deeper into it. On the PE question, on the private equity question, I'll tell you, you know, my experience base is much earlier in the life cycle you know, pre-seed, seed stage, and Series A. And, and a lot of times I, I tend to personally focus into those areas because we're, we're, we're much earlier about getting things off the ground. But a lot of times for a scale-up that's coming to the States, you want those type of tactics still. And the main thing about knowing about it is I would not come to the U.S. and find a general financial investor. I would make sure that you use nuance to find the, the the company or even the angel investment or angel investment group or family office that is very focused in the area that you care about and they care about. What I would not do is come to the United States and find a general, you know, all money is green, but it's not all valuable. I've, I've seen, uh, I can give you a couple different horror stories where, you know, International entrepreneurs came to the States, got money from the wrong kind of investors, and then paid for it dearly because 
the, the American was just dogging them in a way that is not valuable to have on your, you know, in your, in your cap table. And I would be very careful about that. You know, there, it takes a little bit more time to find the nuanced investor that's targeted at your market, but it's worth it. You don't want to have the wrong person handing you cash. All, all cash is green, but it's not, it's not necessarily all good. Yeah, you need smart cash, that's for sure. Um, I think also an interesting question is when to come to the US to raise um, a capital, um, because you don't want to do that too early in your European life cycle. I mean, especially if you're coming for Europe, but you need to find the right um, moment, um, you know, where you're in a sweet spot. Yeah, I would, I, well, let me just respond to that as well. Um, one of the other funny things about my career is I made more money from the startups that I bootstrapped than the ones that I had investors. Um, and so the, the thing that I tend to say, and I think this is true, if, even if you're in Europe is come to the U S first for customers, crank up your valuation. You, you can get it started. It's, it's like, you know, Daniel spoke to this as well. You can, you can contract most times with, with a, an American company way before you actually open the office, you have to find the early adopter, not the early majority customer. I'm talking, I'm, I'm alluding to the technology adoption life cycle. You do not want an early majority customer. You want early adopters, but find customers first. If you're not your investors and yes, they will invest, invest in exotic, you know, European technology. That's great. But the problem is again, if you get, if you get customer traction first with early adopters, not early, early majority customers, if you get customer traction uh, first, you'll be so much better off for it in the long run if, if you can. And certain businesses can't do that, but by and large, the, that early set of conversations can start way before anything else. Oh, for sure. That that goes without question. Uh, Dan, I want to bring in, you back in, uh, um, talking about um, you know finding customers, finding VC, finding money. Um, when um, what what's a fee for service um, model here in the U.S. or um, should you pay fee? Uh, should you expect to pay a fee to find investors or um, other resources? And um, what, what's the what's the model there? Just give us some insights of what you've been seeing. So for maybe for for late stage private equity, but I often tell European startups that nothing marks a company to U.S. VCs as being foreign quicker than than reaching out to U.S. VCs through a paid corporate finance advisor. Simple as that, right? Mm. The, the, the currency of the realm in U.S. venture capital is warm introductions. In other words, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, but it is, right? And that, you know, I, here's an anecdote on that. I once talked to a tier one Silicon Valley VC who said that um, they see 50,000 deals a year, right? And they invest in 30. And they said the, the first line of defense of how they, they get the first filter, rather, as they get from 50 down to 50,000 to 30, is if they recognize the name on the email in the inbox, they will open it. And if they do not, they hit delete, right? In other words, the first filter is, is someone willing to put a little bit of their own brand on the line, a little bit of their personal capital on the line and vouch for the company. And if they are, that's the beginning of many, many filters that the company will, will, will go through, mm. right? In order to raise. And, you know, not only is it a good filter in terms of how do you start to, to, to you know, to break down the 50,030, but from a US VC standpoint, most early to mid-stage VCs are looking for companies that can return the fund or more as the potential exit outcome. And most of them also are public figures. And a lot of American VCs have said to me basically the following, if the early stage startup doesn't have the hustle to figure out a way to get to me through a warm introduction when I'm holding myself out as wanting to find great companies, I sincerely doubt that they're gonna have the hustle to create a fund returning startup. 
Um, very wise words. I think you're absolutely right. It's really what people don't understand. Um, I mean, I see that a lot. You need to build a network and you need to build a network. The moment you, you set foot into this country, you need to talk to everybody and you need to have a good story for them to quickly understand um, what you're doing and um, and then realizing for somebody you're talking to if they have a connection for you in their own network. That's really the, the um, you know, would be based on what you're saying would be my advice um, for, for um, a company coming over here. Um, speaking of coming over here, um, how about, um, you know, the dilemma of um, I'm raising funds in, in the US can I um, continue to be a European company or do I need to, um, you know, transfer IP? Do I need to start a, a, um, an yeah. operations here? Do I need to have employees here? Um, what's your thinking on that? Well, I mean, there, there's the sort of operational question, which is, will US VCs invest in a European startup that has no commercial operational presence in the United States, right? That's not really a legal question. It's more of a you know attractiveness of investment question. And then there's then there's the corporate structure question, which is will US VCs invest into a non-US parent company? Right? That in other words, if the company is otherwise attractive, maybe maybe they're a B2B SaaS company that's got 50% of their revenues coming out of the US, right? Growing 150% year on year. Okay, US VC might be interested in that. But will they, from a corporate structuring standpoint, invest in a German GmbH or a Dutch BV, et cetera? And the rule of thumb is, well, actually, but before I before I explain the rule of thumb, you should understand as a European startup is that the entire US venture financing economy is built on a foundation of investing into Delaware corporations. Anytime you ask a US venture capitalist to invest in a company that is not a Delaware corporation, you are introducing a level of friction into the transaction, right? Now, just being a Delaware corporation doesn't mean that you automatically will be able to find money, but it is very possible that a USVC will turn you down if you do not have a Delaware parent company. In other words, think about having a Delaware parent company as potentially a necessary condition for raising money in the US, but not a sufficient condition for raising money in the United States. But what we see is the later stage the company is, the more likely it is that an American VC is going to be willing to invest from a corporate structuring standpoint into an existing European parent company. And I usually tell European companies the following, especially ones that are in maybe some of the more recognized jurisdictions from a corporate standpoint in the US, like a BV or a GmbH or otherwise. At seed stage, the chances of having to put a Delaware parent company and invert the corporate structure, right, um, in order to raise from US investors is probably about 80%, eight zero. By the time that you get to series A, it drops to about maybe 30 to 35%. At series B, it drops to maybe five to 10%. In other words, the later stage you are, the more the US VCs are willing to, let's say, as we say, not upset the apple cart, right? And accept that the company has been able to scale to a certain size and create certain metrics while wor working through a, um, you know, a non-Delaware company. Mm. Also, the later stage the company gets, the less fungible they are. And, you know, I, you see some of the early stage accelerators in the United States. When you go and join them as a European company, those accelerators will require the European company to flip into a Delaware parent company. I mean, in part because, well, they've got a long wait list. And at the early stage, what's the difference between, you know, this group of two individuals, a dog in a garage, and this other group of, you know, two individuals, a dog in a garage. By the time you get up to series B, there aren't so many, you know, individuals, a dog in a garage. Like you are now an established, company and there aren't that many great opportunities that look like you. In that context, you have more leverage and, it, and there is not so much a greater insistence to flip into a Delaware parent company at that later stage. But the earlier stage you are, absolutely. The only other thing I, I should say, and I do want to stress this point, just because you have a Delaware parent company does not make you investable. 
And I say that because one of the mistakes I see European companies make is that they hear from their friends that they have to flip into Delaware and no one will, will or else no one will pay attention to them. And they spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on a Delaware flip transaction. But the underlying commercials and operational aspects of the business are also not investable by a US VC. In other words, usually it's best to wait to see if US VCs are actually interested in your business before you spend the time, the money, and the effort to invert your corporate structure to flip into a Delaware parent company. Yeah, we're back to the to the topic that we raised. Um, I think Kevin raised it before. Get help, get help early, talk to a lot of people, and then um, take decisions from there. Um, Oliver, we're talking about um, tax considerations here. Um, what do you um, what do you have to add um, on the on the tax side with um, you know flipping and not flipping and IP and um, and and what have you? And there are more well, I, more than that. Yes, I mean I have to again um, two recent transactions, two European uh, in these cases were two German GmbHs that had to go to the US in order to get further funding. And they went through the process to set up a Delaware company and they had to invert the construction. So the parent company now is in the US owning the German company. They had to transfer all the IP. So there's a lot of legal work to do. And it's very critical to get experts on board, not only from the parent company side, whether the company is in Germany, France, or Italy, wherever it is, and from a US tax perspective to really go through the process and do all the homework because fixing things later on is very, very difficult and very costly. Um, so um, we really advise to look at it from an overall perspective. Um, you cannot make a single decision out of Germany, out of the US. You have to look at both tax systems. They're very complex in these matters. Um, and then also later on, once you set up the company, there are certain tax rules here in the US, which uh, we talked about it earlier, when employees or the founders will get stock options or future employees will get stock options. There's a whole set of rules here in the US uh, where you can optimize it, uh, whether you pay tax at the beginning or pay tax and you defer the tax, which makes a huge impact. But there's also, again, you need to talk to a specialist. You need to talk to lawyers who understand what they're doing to avoid mistakes, because we have seen these mistakes uh, over and over again, where at the end of the day, uh, employees were surprised to all of a sudden pay a tax bill. Uh, pay a big tax bill and they have not been properly advised in the beginning. So really the key is to talk to experts on both sides to make sure that the structure is correct because it's a very, very complex situation, but it's working. And um, what I can tell here in regards to finding, uh, uh, raising money, it is in certain areas much easier here in the US to do it than in, in Europe because it's just a different um, a mentality here. And the two companies we worked with recently have been very, very successful here, going through various rounds of financing and they did their homework. And so there is a way here, but you need to have the experts on board. Yeah, I mean, I think really this is the message that um, that we can't repeat often enough. And, um, and you have the EACC network as a resource for that. It is of the essence, and I think Oliver just pointed it out again, fixing a mistake is going to cost you three times as much time and money than, uh, um, than asking the question um, and paying for legal advice or tax advice. I mean, especially legal and tax advice is, is of the essence um, and, you know, creating, getting help to create a network is also absolutely essential. Um, and 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 I also want to add, and legal and tax advice are two different things. I mean, there are things that work very um, um, perfectly on a legal um, from a legal standpoint, but then tax the tax picture behind that decision may be completely different. Just like Daniel just explained, incorporating in Delaware sounds great, but there may be so many other implications um, that that brings along that um, makes you regret it after after the fact. Um, the uh, just to drill down a little bit more into this for for a minute um the on the taxes um are there different tax implications for different industries or um are there specific things that um oliver that's for you that you can share um you know that may be different for different industries 
I don't necessarily think there's uh, that many tax implications for different industries. Um, I think the, these rules in regards to venture capitalists, how to invest, the the tax structuring behind it, uh, especially also on stock options, those are general rules applied to all industries. Uh, there may be here or there some minor exceptions, but overall, I would say it applies to all companies investing or setting up business in the US. Um, where it may differ a little bit is um, in regards to in uh, grants and funding. Uh, and uh, I think um, Kevin talked about it earlier. I mean, the US is very, very keen on attracting businesses, and we see a huge run right now to the US. And when you talk to the various states and on a state level as well on a local level, they're very aggressive to competing against each other. And Texas is a good example. It's a very, very aggressive state. And you've seen announcement in the last couple of months where they were able to attract businesses, but all the other states are as well very keen to get these and they there is money on the line to to spend and so they need the companies need to do their due diligence to find out what is my best place where i need to i need to be and then getting some um you know uh, funding or grants that's the icing on the cake you should never make a decision based on that because that a good money doesn't make a bad location a good location but there's certainly money out there and the states are very aggressive in regards to attracting businesses so that should be something to talk to site selection people to make sure that they you know at least take what's on the, what's available yeah you're absolutely right and it's it ties in with kevin said earlier um you need smart money not just money because there's green money and there is greener money um kevin back to you um for a minute um so uh, what are the growth rates and exit expectations um in the in the us you know so that that really depends on the type of investor in you know daniel mentioned it earlier about the uh, the vcs a venture capitalist wants to return 10 times their investment they want you know one out of their 10 ventures should be able to produce enough wealth to cover the whole fund so that uh, you know one out of the 10 is a absolute you know rock star there's probably two that are okay and they possibly can just throw away the other seven angel investors will care a lot more in fact one of the things that i've seen in a couple different examples that you might find much more patient capital with a family office or an angel investor if you're going a little bit earlier. And sometimes you have super angels that actually will make really big checks, you know, that you might consider as well. The nice thing about that is if you're not trying to do the, you know, go public and, you know, go shoot the moon, there's uh, this notion of earlier exits that where, you know, where you actually build something up and I, I've seen one of our entrepreneurs, you know, exit for $30 million. And now he's in a position to go build the next startup, the next startup, the next startup. He didn't, he didn't build a billion dollar business. He was able to return the money that he made to the angel investors that, that invested in him. Um, and I, I think that that's an under, you know, we don't talk about that enough because sometimes I, I, I give, um, I say it this way, hopefully this uh, doesn't hurt anyone's feelings, but uh, there's too much Silicon Valley porn, Silicon Valley porn that, you know, it's like, we're going to be a superstar. I'm going to build a multi-billion dollar business. And the problem is that then you cozy up to the wrong type of investor. Or if you have that type of technology, do it. That is great. But the problem is that, you know, you might be able to take more money off the table, secure it for yourself, get your return much earlier um, you know, in three years versus 10 years and, uh, and and just by choosing a different type of investor. All I'm trying to say is there's there's times that you wouldn't necessarily go after that that one VC firm that, you know, is to shoot the moon. I don't think enough um, entrepreneurial programs and entrepreneurial uh, conversations are had around that because we get enthralled in the United States with this one version or with this one nar uh, narrative. I think you're absolutely right. Wise words, um, because you need to find the right fit. We have a company right now that is very early stage out of Israel. They have an absolutely fascinating um, a product technology. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a um, I'm wondering if I call it ag tech or life science, life science slash ag tech. 
and um, they are too early to talk to a, um, a major, major company who is right now looking for projects. But they're no no one ready to uh, uh, nowhere near ready to to exit, and this company would um, investor would or corporate investor I would say um, is more an exit type investor than than anything else. So same same holds true here. Find the right investor that fits your situation in the moment in time that you're talking to them. And um, we we only have a, 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 um, a t maybe ten or so minutes left. Um, final last words um, from um, from each of you. Um, you know, final thoughts on uh, um, maybe three things people should do to uh, um, before they come to the U.S. Kevin, do you want to start? I mean, the main thing is just recognize the three tensions. So you're you're hearing three. One one of the powerful things about this seminar is that we have three different voices that will pull you in three different directions. You know, the me as the business innovator technology guy, right, that's going to say, focus on early customers and all that sort of stuff. And in de-risking, from my point of view, I'm going to talk about, hey, you know, you screw up. You're probably going to screw up some of the legal stuff. You're going to screw up some of the accounting stuff. Uh, really engage with customers. Recognize that there's three different tensions here, and with respect to my colleagues as well, um, you know, it's like they're de-risking an investment, de-risking your venture as you enter into this market. Just recognize that that you have to manage across the three tensions. My point of view is not the right one; it's just one of the three. And and I just want to make sure that you hear those tensions because as we as we de-risk things, obviously the three of us have different points of view. Um, and all three are important. And so I just, uh, I sometimes in my own entrepreneurial scar tissue that I care, carry to donate to you guys, um, I wanna make sure that you, you hear all three of them and that you understand that all three are important. Uh, Dan, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I, I wanna maybe just take a quick opportunity to, to, to bridge what I've seen as a, um, often is a cultural gap between Europe and the United States when it, when, when it comes to expansion. If I was a European startup listening to this video, one of the things I would take away is why are they drumming on about working with lawyers, tax accountants, and professional services advisors? Why does any of this matter? Isn't that just like, that's just gonna drain me dry and all they do that I, that I ever deal with when lawyers and accountants and people like that is I instruct them. I tell them what to do. They don't add any value to my business. I just pay them and they, they do a service for me. And that is, in my experience, a very common perspective on professional service among European startups. And so from a European startups perspective, in my experience, when they hear Americans say, oh, you gotta go get lawyers and tax advisors and professional services advisors, it's like, why? It's like, why, why does that matter? Right, because America is different, right? America is very different. And the two things I'm gonna highlight about America are the following. Number one, it is 50 states. And each of the 50 states has its own legal system and its own tax system and a whole its own re regulatory system. And it's not quite like all the different countries of the European Union, but it's not that dissimilar either, right? And it seems a lot easier than it is, but the reality of it is, is that, you know, one of my favorite examples, and I, I will bleed over very quickly to tax, and I, and I apologize for that, but a friend once told me that there are 13,000 different taxing geographies in the United States, right? That when you, when you total up city, county, state, and federal, you get 13,000 taxing geographies. And it's funny, because when I tell that to European startups, they get the kind of deer in the headlights fear look. When I tell that to someone in San Francisco, they shrug and they say, I don't care. That's what I use my accountant for, right? That is, the Europe is a DIY environment. The United States is not a DIY environment in that context because you've got better things to do, like scale your business massively, right? Rather than, than trying to deal with the 13,000 taxing geographies internally. And the second thing that I think really throws European startups for a loop in that respect that they don't see is the litigation environment in the United States. I think that they hear that the US is litigation rich, but they don't understand why the US is litigation rich. And the reason is a fundamental difference, and I'll be quick on this, 
The fundamental difference that in the United States, unlike almost anywhere else in the world, each party bears its own costs on legal fees, even if they win. And an environment where each party bears its own costs in litigation, even if they win, then the threat of litigation can be weaponized and, and can be used as a business negotiation tool, right? To, to drive favorable business outcomes. Because even if the other side wins, they lose in many respects by having to pay, right? And that's not something that European startups typically understand when they get to the US, because it's not that way for the most part in, 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 in Europe. And so what that leads to though, is an environment where professional services, lawyers, tax accountants, and others answer a very fundamental question that might be surprising to a lot of European startups that they are answering, which is how does my company achieve their business goals while managing risk, right? In other words, you can't just run your business and not focus on risk in the United States because then you get run over by the legal and compliance train or the tax train, right? But if you just focus on risk and compliance in the US, you will never get anything done. And what the, the, the real value add of advice in the, in the US is to help you answer that question. How do I achieve business success in the United States while appropriately managing risk? And I just wanted to flag that because again, in my experience as an American in Europe, that is a, that's a cultural divide between how you run a business in the UK, in, in, in Europe versus how you run a business in the United States. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's also a question of time. Um, Oliver, one sentence. Um, yeah, and then I 100% to... agree with what has been said before. Um, and I say, that's why it's important to talk to the right advisors, because like in our case as well, and this is not promoting what we do, but since we focusing and specializing in what we do, we provide tax advice and accounting advice, but we understand your business. We're not, we're not running your business, but we also sometimes do understand you don't need a 20 page memo. You need a, a one page and it, it needs to be practical as well. So we sometimes say, yes, it depends. That's always what you hear from lawyers and from C accountants and CPAs. But we, we do understand that if you would apply, uh, comply with all the rules and regulations in the US, you don't even put a foot on the, on the ground because it's way too complicated. But we work with many, many successful firms, so you need to talk to someone who understands that as well and guides you through it and to just avoid mistakes. That's all what we try to do here. And um, have advisors that help you focus on the actual business that yes. you um, should be focusing on, um, yeah. which is growing, um, growing the organization in the US. Um, with that, um, a very, very interesting um, discussion. Thank you. Um, Dan, Kevin, Oliver, um, for sharing your insights with um, with our audience, and um, thank you, Aaron, for putting all of this together. Um, I'm with this um, handing um, the conversation back to Crispin, who is going to uh, um, close the program. And um, Crispin, with that, uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Yvonne, and really a big thank you from me to to all of you to I mean you, uh, Yvonne and Erin for sharing this thing in such and asking such, you know, using such intelligent questions to kind of get the most out of our three very talented pa uh, panelists, uh, Kevin, Dan, Oliver. Really, I've been listening, and and as somebody who lived in the states, I, I was in the micro, not quite state that was Washington D.C. Uh, uh, and I remember when I first went to the States being told there is no such thing as America. There's 50 states. You better understand it. There's 50 different Americas. And I think you really brought that up. I didn't realize there were 13,000 taxing geographies. Uh, so that that's really a new one for me. But colleagues, really a big thank you to you and a big thank to our colleagues in the internationalization thematic group to Thomas Steyer, to Christos Skouros on, on our side, and the colleagues in, in Ismaia, Elfrida, as always, for setting this, this up. I think it's really useful. Just like to emphasize, we haven't talked a bunch about the Enterprise Europe Network today. Um, I'm guessing that anyone listening, firstly, we have EN advisors, but if you're any startups, please, before you make that big leap, and I think we heard some very good advice about that, the, the need to kind of think before you make that leap and plan it carefully. Talk to your EN advisors. We're really here to help you. We have scale up advisors in place who can help you. So really use that. And, and I think it will be there. 
But then, thank you, I really think we learned so much about the startup ecosystem. I really took away about the three tensions, but also breaking down the stages of funding. But the big thing I wrote down was kind of, this is a reality check. You, 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 and, and not in a little bit scary, but also what I felt that, that all three of you were very practical. So if you're listening on, don't be put off. I think it was very much a message of encouragement, but but kind of go there with, with care. So just to say that's, um, thank you for this. We're having another webinar doing business in Vietnam on the 4th of April, that's the other side of Easter. Uh, and in general, in case you don't, you're not already aware, this is part of a kind of webinar series about embracing global markets organized by our colleagues in EN. Uh, and these, I have to finally point out that these, all of these webinars are gonna be publicly web, web streamed and so please spread the word. I think these are really interesting and, and practical opportunities. So with that, thank you once again, colleagues, for such an excellent hour and a bit. And, and really thank you for everybody else for, for, to, for, for, your, for, your, for your good questions. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.